Um, so I hope today will be a little bit of a, a palate cleanser uh, with all the really super technical talks on a very specific use case. Um, so I, I think there's two reasons why this, this presentation may be a little bit different than the others. Um, the first, I can pretty much guarantee you're going to disagree with some of my points. Uh, I'm talking a lot about artistic expression. And to do so, I need, I need a reference of this is, this is a, a good representation of art. And of course, it's highly subjective. So I would encourage you to, to disagree as, as vociferously as, you, as you'd like. Um, the second of this, uh, the second reason why I think this is different is we get into the idea of, of having machines express themselves through literature. And we get into natural language processing and grammar. And I actually really love grammar um, because as, as someone who's more mathematical by nature, this is a, a system of rules that kind of govern um, the way writing works. So I would actually encourage you to, uh, if, if I have a grammatical slip up, uh, you know, I take that pretty seriously. So uh, feel, feel free to challenge me uh, and heckle me if I, if I make a mistake. Um, all right. so. Pretty excited to talk uh, to you guys today. It seems like uh, this is really good timing. We have a lot of vendors, and I, I work for one of them, disclosure, full disclosure, uh, Data Robot, but there's some others as well, talking about AutoML. Um, so AutoML, auto the purpose of AutoML is just to completely replace you and put you out of a job. That's, that's sarcasm, and we'll get into that later. But so it's actually the opposite. So um, data scientists have this special, uh, call it a special sauce where the magic happens to frame problems, to advance feature engineering based on your domain expertise, um, and also tinker with your results to get from a, maybe an 80% solution. Uh, it's perfectly, perfectly viable to that 90, 99% solution. I wouldn't say 100, you'd probably have target leakage. Um, so what AutoML does for you is it's like hitting the fast forward button to get you to that 80% model there you can add your special expertise and get the rest of the way there. Um, so I thought what I would do is bookend this because there seems to be a lot of AutoML talk going on um, with some, some of the hot topics, what I see in AutoML every day. Um, I should actually mention for context, I'm a practicing data scientist. I work in somewhat of a consulting, ro uh, consulting role. So I wanted to talk about some of the, the, uh, the tasks that I'm working on right now actively. Um, Inconveniently is during this conference, a lot of my customers wanted to go to POC, but just a couple examples. I had to write them down, otherwise I'll think of the names, and I'm probably not allowed to mention the names, but there's an online site where you submit questions and experts. You know, I have a question on plumbing, on, on legal, I have a legal question on healthcare. It'll be forwarded to an expert, and so they're interested. My customer is interested in routing that question and assigning the category and basically monetizing that operation. Uh, I'm working on a couple extra uh, projects worth mentioning. Uh, there's, there's a marketing company that handles local sports teams for a medium-sized American city. And what they want to do is, is they're interested in the attribution of their social media. If I tweet a video about a player on a Saturday night and the game's on a Sunday afternoon, what can I do to increase the engagement of that photo or that video or that tweet? Um, the, another one would be airlines. So the airlines are really interesting. They're, they're all about monetizing uh, air travel, right? So they're interested in customer churn, uh, pilot sickness, and predicting delays, and, and so on. So lots of different interesting projects and applications of machine learning. And I hope that whatever project you're working on, you can kind of see uh, those are similarities uh, with the projects uh, that I'm working on. Um, and another thing I forgot to mention, I'm going to show you some examples of some code. And I've got my Twitter handle approximately here. So it's, it's on every slide. You don't have to write it down. But uh, I have a tweet that I just sent out a few days ago that, that is a link to my GitHub. So all the, reference that I'm, the references that I'm going to mention and links to the code that I ran are there. And you can just get them via Twitter. So anyway, hot topics. Um, so what I said was AutoML gets you that fast forward 80%. It allows you to tinker to get to, say, 99% solution, hopefully. Um, but in addition to that, some of the hot topics are doing that same thing, but, but applying that methodology to time series. So we have a time series pro uh, product. But being able to work on more algorithms, 
uh, more automated feature engineering and the way we do our back tests. It's really important for time series. So that's a really hot topic and a lot of development going on. The next one is focusing um, beyond classification regression time series into the, I, I didn't want to say unsupervised, but the non-supervised, so let's say uh, certainly anomaly detection, but also reinforcement learning, um, semi-supervised, et cetera. So we're, we're getting into that, being able to do that in an automated fashion. And the last one is as we increase the complexity of our algorithms, they become harder and harder to interpret. And so what we're, what we're focusing on is using some techniques from game theory, such as the Shapley algorithm, to create better feature importance and essentially reason codes. Uh, so that's a lot of the, the interesting things that, that we're moving, and I think the auto ML industry in general is moving towards automating more of that process. All right, so what I wanted to do, so I'm really fascinated with uh, certainly machine learning, but how computers can express themselves artistically. Uh, so I chose three different types of, uh, of media. So I, I painting, uh, literature, and music. And I have various degrees of passion about these things based on my own uh, uh, experiments. But so what I wanted to do was take stock of how we teach uh, computers to express themselves in a way, thinking about how that differs from how we teach humans. And what can we learn from that? And comparing the results, uh, what kind of uh, assessments can we make? And how can we tie that back to our everyday, our everyday lives, our everyday jobs in machine learning? Um, so I'm going to stay pretty, pretty high level. Um, but maybe if there's some questions after, we can go deeper. So certainly at this point, I just what I wanted to do is pick examples that have withstood the test of time. So I can go. I, I'm sure we all have guilty pleasures with popular music, a song we, we, we like right now that we maybe wouldn't want everybody else to know we like. So that's our preference. But what I wanted to look at is things that, over time, there's generally a consensus. This represents um, something that we all would consider as good art um, or artistic and has a lot of merit. Um, so, so, so my barrier really is, or, or, or my metric is, has it withstood the test of time. So generally, a lot of these examples are going to be um, not too current. Um, all right, so I'm sure everybody, everybody has your favorites. And I, to me, these are examples of a lot of people were trying to do this. These, were, these are, I mean, Van Gogh, Shakespeare, and Beethoven, I assume everybody knows those, of people who did a little bit differently and maybe did it a little bit uh, better or interesting. And that's why, that, why they've stood out. So a brief, very brief, um, primer on neural networks, because neural networks, because this is all based on neural network technology. And I know probably at least half of you could probably come up and, and describe the process. Um, but the point is just to get all the terminology uh, out in the open, because a lot of this, uh, the way that we teach machines to express themselves artistically is based on the neural network uh, perceptron, which is what I have here. So very quickly, you've got some input data. Uh, and you've got some output data that you'd like to predict. In the middle, you have the yellow, which is what's considered a hidden layer that uh, collects the signals from the input data and applies what's called an activation function to smush the data, either between negative 1 and 1 or 0 and 1, uh, basically to regulate that information to a certain scale and then uh, connect it to the output. And we do that with every arrow, and I, not all the arrows are shown. Um, but in a fully connected network, all the arrows would be connected, and those are weights. And we start with random weights. Um, and as you can imagine, we feed data, our input data, through the network to get an output and, and, the, and then measure the error. And the model is horrible, right? We have random weights. It should be horrible. So what we do is we take the information, and we take that error, and we push it back through the network from right to left on your screen. And adjust the weights so the, the error isn't so bad. And so that term is that's generally referred to as back propagation. And we've, we've chosen activation units that are differentiable very easily um, to make this process faster. We do this again and again and again and again. And at some point, the error becomes so low that we've actually learned the pattern pretty well for this, for this model to predict the output layer accurately. And what happens if you keep going 
it's going to basically memorize the data, and that's a big no-no, that's called overfitting, where you've memorized the data, your specific training data, and you're unable to see new patterns. So generally, you want to find the point at which overfitting has occurred, and you want to go back to a previous version of the model, previous epoch of, of the data being sent through that model. So it's very quick primer on neural networks. I worked at a company in, in the year 2000 called HNC, and we built a fraud model, fraud model called Falcon for credit card transactions, and it was state of the art at the time, and this is all we used. Um, so since then, a lot of network architecture fills in additional hidden layers. So I have one yellow hidden layer here, one at two, one at three, one at four. It's not that long ago, um, but in the year 2000, we couldn't solve that with the hardware we have, uh, an, an additional hidden layer. Now that's, that's a very easy thing to solve. So it's, um, it's come, a, come, come a long way. Uh, it's very humbling of what we can do now with your laptops that you have versus what we had to build hardware to do back then. Okay, so that's a network, uh, neural network. And to, to teach machines how to create art, uh, we're gonna go through a couple of different versions, uh, extensions of this basic neural network. Uh, so the first one is painting. So this is kind of an example of what if you, you asked me to draw a cat, it's probably what I, what I would come up with. I'm, I'm not a good artist at all. Um, it's weird because my daughter is, is really good. Uh, at, some people just seem to have that talent. Uh, I don't really know how, how that works. I think painting could be the oldest form of expression. Um, so we need to adjust a neural network model. So a neural network model typically ignores one really important thing when you're dealing with images, and that's pixels. So location is extremely important. If I have a fraud model that says, uh, here's how many new merchants that have been visited in the last two days, and here's the, um, the acceleration in spending over that same time period. Those things are just treated separately. They're, they're not ad adjacent to each other in the network. Um, but with, with images, that's, that's really important. Um, so I have a picture here um, of, of Winnie the Pooh. So how do we transfer that image into uh, a form that the computer can understand so that it might start to learn how to draw. So, so it's all about pixels. So what, I, what I've done is created a really trivial example. Um, images tend to have meg megapixel images are, are very common now. Um, so what we want to do is we've got a tremendous amount of data. We need to reduce that data while capturing the, the position of those pixels in relation to each other. Um, so what I have here is an, an example of the convolution operation. Um, many of you have heard of convol convolutional neural networks, or CNNs. So this is the basic operation. I just wanted to walk through this really quickly, because then I want to break down how we use this to create stylistic um, paintings. So it's kind of color-coded. I didn't want to animate the whole thing. Uh, it's a lot of pixels. But, um, so what we do is we create this kernel, or this window. It's the three by three red square. What we do is we, we take this, we, 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 we draw the box around that visual field. In this case, it's nine pixels. And we connect each one of those with a weight, just like a regular neural net, to one of the pixels over in the, the four by four square. So the first red square is sending uh, actually nine different arrows to that first, uh, in the top left, the first pixel. And then what we do is we slide the window over. You could slide it any amount, but we slide it one over. We do the same thing. And if you keep doing that, you're gonna get four rows on the top, four pixels. Those are just like the hidden layer of the basic neural net. And then what we do is we come back to the front, and uh, the, the very left, and then drop it down one. And we do the same thing, drop it down one, same thing. And we do that, you get 16 separate pixels. Uh, and so that's the idea of a convolution. And those, those nine weights that are connected to, the, to each pixel are shared among all those, those uh, 16 connections. Each, each one has nine connections to one of the 16 points, but they are, they are the shared weights. So they're all the nine weights are the same for each one. And so what we've done there is we've reduced the data, and we've also maybe started to look at high-level uh, connections among pixels, such as colors, such as edges, or corners that may be part of a bigger shape. And then once you hit the, uh, 
the convolution, we have a different kinds of, of activation called max activation. Uh, I mean, so, so, excuse me, rectified linear units is the activation there. Um, so it's a little bit different, but still easily differentiable. Um, the next step common in a convolution would be a pooling. So what I would take is, I take the blue box, I would just take the max value and transfer that exactly with no activation function, or the maximum is the, the activation, to the pooling layer. So it's further breaking down, um, it's reducing the data, and then making the solution more invariant or more robust. For instance, if you had, uh, if you had uh, a pointy ear that might be part of a cat, uh, that could appear anywhere in the, in, the, in the picture, or it could be any size. Photos can be different sizes from different angles. And so it's making your model more invariant to changes in the, in the image. Um, so we keep doing this, convolution pooling, multiple layers, multiple layers. And here's an example of what a fully connected layer might be. Many, many convolutions uh, and pooling, um, many different layers on top of layers, all the way to get down to where I might want to make an inference. Is this a dog or a cat? Um, or it's trained on the ImageNet, which is a database which has 11,000 types of images. Uh, so this is a pre-trained model that we can just use to try to teach a machine how to imbibe or imbue some sort of style onto an image, effectively teaching a computer how to paint. Um, so here's a, here's a quick question for you guys. Um, these are Van Gogh paintings. One of them's not. I hope I didn't make this too easy, but I probably did. Um, so which one of these is a fake Van Gogh? So anybody vote for number one? Number two? Number three? Number four? I think I got a lot of non-votes. Um, that's okay. So I tried to make this as hard as I could. So I picked the three Van Goghs that I had never, uh, the most uh, unrecognizable to me. Um, so here, here's the, the answer. So uh, this isn't the starry night over the Rhone. It's a starry, similarly starry night over the Salzac uh, when I was in Salzburg, which, and I took the photo because I thought this looks like starry night. So um, just a little, little razzle dazzle there. So how does this work? And this is some code that you can use uh, any, any laptop you have just with a CPU. It'd take you maybe 20 minutes depending on the size of the, um, the size of the photos. So here's how it works. Um, convolutional neural nets um, were trained mainly to classify images, and that's the basic use. But you can break that down, and, and um, that, that idea of taking an image and, 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 and extracting the content is in the same way you can kind of um, um, basically as a, as a byproduct get the style of that image. So what we do is we take um, for my top photo is this is, the, this is what I want you to copy. Um, that's the actual Starry Night. Um, and we take five of those layers of the convolutional neural net. So there are many layers of that convolutional neural net. But if we take a couple of different versions of that as we abstract more and more, we can kind of combine that. And it goes through this process called the Gram matrix, which just allows for cor correlations uh, among the vectors. We, if we process that, um, we kind of come up with the essential style of that image. So I, now I have my content. And I can take, again, a pre-built convolutional neural net. These things take days to build on, on a host of GPUs. So I didn't have access to that. So I just used an existing uh, model. And so we take, in this case, the four is the fourth layer of convolution. And then second is the second channel. So you can do multiple um, channels at each convolutional layer, learning different shapes and so on. Um, so we take that, and that's, that's, a, that's essentially called the content. And we add those two together, and that gets the the total cost. And so now it's just a basic uh, neural net back propagation uh, error optimization problem. So what I would do is start with a completely random image, random noise. And then I calculate, just like a neural net, I calculate my style cost, which doesn't really change. And I compare that to the, my, my output. It's going to be terrible, right? Uh, because it's just random. So now what I do is I change the target issue, uh, the target image to be closer and have less error to the style content. Iterate again and again and again, you get something like in the target. Um, so 
here's an example of a machine is kind of creating art, but what is it really doing? It's taking the examples that we give it, uh, learning, learning from that, and kind of applying that pattern um, the way we tell it to. Um, so I would say in this case, um, there's a lot of different ways to do this. This uh, work copies some sort of style. Uh, but this is about as good as you get. Um, again, this is, is subjective. So if I ask the computer to just uh, come up with something new without training it, um, it, the results would be kind of, kind of scary and probably a lot like my, my original painting. Um, so that's, a, that's an example of what we get when we try to teach a, uh, teach a computer how to paint. Um, and that code is available if you want to run that. So you could, you could give it your own style photo and your own content and, and create your own. It certainly doesn't have to be a, a Van Gogh example. Um, all right, so now I want to move on to writing. This is something I'm a, I'm a little bit more, more passionate about. Um, I, love, I love the way NLP can kind of teach us about the way we use language. So what's, what's different about, say, so convolutional neural nets, we looked at images. What's important about images? It's the location. So things, we, we measure the, the, the position of things in an image to figure out what kind of image that is. With writing, it's all about the sequence of words. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, I have my pet peeves, and as I get older, just they turn me into cantankerous, I guess, but words that people use that they really don't know what they mean, um, like decimate, I feel like it gets used incorrectly. Um, exponentially, that's, that's one that gets used, ironically, exponentially uh, incorrectly, I think. Um, and also, like when we were talking about artificial intelligence, it's like, Usually when you add the word art artificial in front of something, it means it's bad, like uh, uh, artificial turf, uh, artificial um, ingredients, insemination, uh, intelligence. Um, it's just kind of interesting how we picked artificial intelligence to kind of be the, be the buzzword. Uh, but I love that stuff, and grammar is really, I'm really passionate about grammar, and it surprises me when I hear something in a television program or a movie. Like, didn't you have people with English degrees reading the script? So one of my biggest pet peeves is between you and I. So I know that's wrong um, anytime. So it's, it's whenever I hear that, I kind of I cringe. Um, so I love, I love a, applying math to, to writing in the form of natural language processing. And so it's, it's all about the sequence. Um, they're just, just word, uh, language is just a sequence of tokens that are, are words and that are built on, on letters. And that's kind of how we teach uh, humans to, to read and write. So I'm really interested in that. So I don't know if anybody's heard of, of Raymond Chandler. Um, he wrote a long time ago in the, in the 30s and 40s. Um, kind of a hard-boiled type of private eye. So what I could do is show you Shakespeare. Shakespeare's kind of the hello world in trying to mimic artistic style through literature. Um, but I wanted to see what it could do, give it a little bit harder, uh, writing with a little bit harder edge to it. So typically, uh, Raymond Chandler's stories have uh, a lot of gun violence, a lot of drinking, and possibly a woman in distress, but she may turn out to not be in distress, so um, some sort of femme fatale. So I wanted to see, if I gave the computer examples of this, what it could come up with. Um, however, here's an example of, and this, this is an example uh, in my code as well. When you teach a computer, when you give a comp computer examples, you're essentially teaching it. Learn to write, start from scratch every time, and learn to write, pick up the cadence, pick up the alphabet, the spelling of words, the punctuation. And so here, this is actually just pops right out. It's a, it's a uh, what, what would I call it, a hypothetical conversation among Romeo, Richard III, and Mercutio, who I don't think appeared side by side in any plays. But, at a first glance, like if the doors were open and somebody walked by, they'd probably say, well, what are they talking about? Am I in the wrong conference? Or are we talking about Shakespeare here? Because it really looks good. But then when you start to read it, I think similarly to when you, uh, when you use the approach versus painting, there, it's technically good, but does it mean anything? Or does it provoke a reaction, maybe, is, is the test. Um, so here, this is just it kind of babble the closer you look. But it did really learn the cadence. Um, I don't think it ever rhymes, not that Shakespeare always rhymes, but there may be father's son, Duke is done, but that might be accidental. It's a small sample size. 
So basically from scratch, it learned the language based on what we gave it. So you can have a lot of fun with this. You could actually, you could, you could send it anything. You could, you could supply uh, code, like Python scripts, and it'll actually learn how to write a code that probably will compile. It might not do anything. Um, so it's just gonna learn basically the patterns in, in order to mimic that. So it's all about sequence. And when it's all about sequence, the family of neural networks uh, that have produced the most compelling results are recurrent neural networks. So it's very similar, um, a lot of connections here, so every line is really a, a series of lines. It's essentially a vector of weights, but we have the input, these are the words. It was the best of dot, dot, dot. And we have the output. Um, so given the input, the word it, I wanna try to predict the word was. And so I'm gonna learn the sequence given by, by being given a many, 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 many values. And what happens is we, so there's many nodes in that yellow. It's actually many, many yellow circles, but it's all in one. And many, many green and red circles as well. The green would be your entire vocabulary of your, of your, your, your corpus. And the red would be that same vocabulary. So I just want to learn the connections uh, among all of the different uh, inputs and outputs, essentially. And that's what happens when I learn this over time. Now, we, f we feed this one token at a time. So I have it, and I, wanted, I want to try to train it to predict was. I'm gonna do very badly, right, because I have random weights, so we're gonna adjust it, and that's how we're going to learn the sequence of, in this case, words, basically learning the language. So there's a very big limitation of this. RNNs work really well on short sequences, especially we're using them a lot in uh, they can be effective in time series. Like what's the, what's the uh, pressure on this pipe over the last hour, you know, and using that as a sequence. So it can be really effective. But over time, it becomes cumbersome to, to have this memory um, to go back. Basically, just try to think of, of your own experience with language to go back to the first word you ever heard and try to carry information along that entire sequence. Um, that becomes very difficult, and a lot of these, these arrows, these weights, will just completely go to zero. So it's becoming a, a, a very big limitation of recurrent neural networks in language models. So typically, there are two big families of improvements. Uh, they're, they're very similar, but two improvements to this basic recurrent neural net problem of understanding memory. How much, how much should I pay attention to what I just heard and what I heard before that? and so on. So the two um, general solutions to this problem are LSTM, long short-term memory units on the left, and GRU, gated recurrent units. So essentially what happens is, what's really important is the state of the cell. That just keeps, that carries information throughout the sequence. Uh, so it's really important, it's not, it's not critical that you, uh, Let's put it this way, if you've never seen this before, I'm probably not gonna give you enough information to go out and use it now, but you could use my code um, as an example. Um, but essentially what it's doing is it's, it's capturing that cell state, that memory. And what it does is, is it uses things called gates. Gates regulate the amount of information that we pass on to the next round as we go on the sequence. Um, so we might have the existing cell state, and, and it might be zero when you start off at, when you start building, but you, what you would do is you take the, the previous hidden state, combine it with the input, and then, and then combine it with this, uh, this forget gate. And that regulates how much memory, uh, how much of the previous cell state and the current input do I wanna send to the next cell state. So by this way, um, it allows you to, to train your model how much to remember. So these are just neural, in, neural networks inside, tiny neural networks inside uh, these cells that allow you to learn how much should I remember and how much should I forget. Well, it depends on the sequence you're trying to learn. Um, so that's, uh, that's a little bit on LSTM. And um, the main difference between LSTM and GRUs is that GRUs only has the, uh, the cell state. It forgoes, uh, architecturally, it forgoes the hidden state. So to me, I prefer the GRUs because they're simpler and they will converge faster or in the same amount of time I can train my data more. So we just pump data through this in order to learn those connections. And when, you, and when you do that, it can learn from scratch how to create new sentences. It's kind of a, a generative 
uh, property of this is really interesting. Um, so for instance, uh, you can do this with any, you just need a text file. Uh, you might need to clean it up a little bit for all the weird characters. Um, but so I just took three of my favorite um, Raymond Chandler novels, kind of that hard-boiled Los Angeles detective in the 30s, um, and I wanted to see what, what the computer would come up with. So um, here, here's, some, here's some examples. Um, the cadence, I'm actually impressed. I, I think the cadence is about right. Like um, short, choppy sentences that there's a lot of action. So the broken pictures of a brief, of a repulation screen. So this is actually training on 100 characters, not 100 words, 100 characters. So that's why at some point it might try to create a new word based on, this looks like it should be a word based on some of the other words that I've seen, um, the sequence of essentially characters. He played over the bottle of the steps and could see the table. I mean, that doesn't make sense, but I can see that it did pick up some of that style. So I would say the machines are kind of 0 for 2 in the sense of coming up with something new that, that was better than the original. Um, all right, so I want to move on to composing. So this is the one I'm most excited about. Um, I, took a, I took piano lessons when I was younger. Um, so I'm very aware of, of the limitations of teaching uh, piano to, to students. And I, I'm wondering, uh, did, did anybody else take uh, some lessons on any kind of, uh, any instrument? Um, so who could walk up to a piano and find middle C? Yeah. Um, read music? Yeah. Uh, what about your, do you know your chords? You know, like dominant seventh, diminished. Yeah, okay. Um, so I was, I was pretty excited. Um, oh, I hated taking piano lessons. But later in life, I thought, hey, this is cool. I know how to do this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it up again. So what I wanted to, in, in all of these cases, I want to show you examples of what I think are representative of, of uh, good representations of humans creating art. So what I have here is a little piano medley um, that I wanted to share with you. And I'm hoping that, that our sound works. So this is a fingers crossed. Um, I recorded this on about a week ago. So this is just some of my favorite pieces of the last 250 years. It's short. Uh, and I'm just playing with my little iMovie on my Mac. So here's a couple things. I hope the sound works.
so it's surprisingly hard to do that without making too many mistakes. So I, I, and never overlook the, the power of a good uh, lighting and sound engineer. So it was really difficult. Um, so anyway, um, that's my examples of what I consider uh, selections uh, of, of music throughout the years. So uh, how do we teach? Oh, I gotta get my slides back. But so what I was interested in is, so now I know exactly how um, a human learns. I have a lot of experience with that. I would like to see how uh, a machine can do the same thing. So a little bit more difficult. So you know, images had its own little, little difficulty, language, the sequence. Music has certainly is a sequence, so RNN should work pretty well. But it's also got things like little themes that repeat, um, dynamics, uh, rests, lyrics. So now it's got a whole lot of things to try to, to try to keep track of. So I was really interested in how this problem would be solved. So um, there's this idea of attention. Uh, so I wanted to, it's not like, may I have your attention? Um, but it's a different little take on how we look at, at models. So I have uh, the first few, bar, uh, few bars of uh, the Mozart's sonata. Um, so the, in the red, those are the, the notes. So what we could do is we set up an RNN. It should work, right? Because there's sequence of notes. Um, C, E, G, B, C. And then it's got, we've got to try to uh, learn the output of E, G, B, C, D. So we might learn the, um, what a typical harmony might look like. Um, so this, this method uh, has definitely been tried, and LSTMs are really, um, that's one of the first, uh, the pioneering methods for trying to learn music or write new music. Um, but the idea of attention, and here's kind of an illustration of why it's different. So a, a, a big limitation of RNN-based models is they look at the sequence. But it was, it was found, that especially in machine translation type of, um, type of problems, that you really want to look at the entire set of your output um, in, in context to try to, in, in, in doing so, for instance, like a sentence from, from English to German, if you had access to the entire sentence, um, you might do a better job at translating. But it was found that something similar works for music to, to try to pick up on those recurring phrases. Um, so the idea of attention is that every note in the sequence is pairwise connected, and we can look for correlations among every other node in that sequence. Um, and so that's kind of representative by, by this matrix here. And when you do it, so you could have a different output, for instance, uh, the same sentence in English and German, or you could have a series of notes, um, but also related to itself. And that's called self-attention, and that's really at the core of a lot of the music models. Um, so, you know, for instance, we can try to pick up themes like uh, Beethoven's fifth. So it's got that four note, ba 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 bum, right? And that's repeated and kind of tinkered with throughout the piece. That's kind of an example of some of the themes that, that we use in music. Um, so I've got a few more things I want to play. So I've got to uh, hustle through here. So how do we get attention into a model? It's kind of complicated, but the, you might have heard of transformer models. Uh, so these are fairly new, um, although nothing is, is truly new in machine learning. But this is a way in which um, attention-based models are used rather than an RNN sequence. So on the left, I just have a query is the current note, let's say. And the K is the reference to all other notes. And that provides that attention. But you're also supplying that vector V, which is, again, those, uh, the entire uh, vocabulary, let's say, of the notes. Um, so the, anyway, that's attention. And the transformer model is completely free of any RNN neural networks. So it, it can train in parallel much faster, but it all also doesn't have that strict adherence to sequence. Um, so what I wanted to play for you now, um, I've got a little continuation. So I'm gonna play Moonlight Sonata, and then I'm gonna show you what a machine does when given this input. It's really short. So that's Moonlight Sonata. Hopefully you've heard of it. Um, here's 
Given that as input, here's what a computer makes of that. Hopefully the sound. All right, so you can kind of hear that it, it took that in, in the basic sheet means it's just a D minor chord, but just kind of expanding on that a little bit. Um, so, so you can, you can, the links to that and uh, the OpenAI is the tool, a tool called MuseNet created that. Um, so that's an example of writing music. Uh, if you want to take it one step forward, um, Magenta, so if you, if you, if you Google search uh, machine learning, writing music or composing music, Magenta is going to be the one that pops up. So what they did is they took the idea of the transformer and they changed it a little bit to, to this, this um, the innovation here was this idea of SREL, it's the relative proximity of the notes to each other. So I figured out a way to even add more context to that. And if you, and here's an example of, so this is not based on anything, this is a completely new, uh, concerto based on magenta, and there's links to this. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure what to, what to make of that. It's, it's kind of, number one, it's very impressive, I think. Uh, technically correct. Uh, does it provoke any kind of uh, uh, artistic uh, response to that? I, I'm not sure about that. It just seems like uh, that's a really tough, uh, tough uh, thing for those um, machine learning um, models to, to try to learn or try to replace. Um, so that's why I wanted to bring that back to AutoML. So um, does it seem like the, the computers are replacing um, what, what we do every day, and I think it actually just confirms the idea of AutoML, take care of all the, the, the repetitive stuff. The computer's really good at learning the language and creating the cadence of, of something very complex, but it's missing something. And so I, I think it's kind of missing the, uh, the magic, the secret sauce, uh, the soul is kind of what, what I'm insinuating here that, that only humans can provide, and we see that. In, in not only in painting and, and writing and music, but kind of the projects that we, we do every day. Um, so I think with AutoML, we, we automate everything up to that point, and the rest is up to, to you and, and to me. So I think I'm right at time, but uh, uh, that's it. And I hope you, I encourage you to play with, uh, with some of the stuff because it's, it's really a lot of, lot of fun.